Before the world was ever gripped by the coronavirus, the Global Health Security Index rated every country on its pandemic preparedness. The average overall score across the globe was 40.2 out of 100, while high-income countries had an average score of 51.9. But the highest score of any country, head and shoulders above the rest, was the United States, with a score of 83.5. Rich, strong, and developed, America was supposed to be the shining example of how to respond to a pandemic should such a catastrophic situation ever arise. Now, several months into that once hypothetical worst case scenario, the illusion of America's readiness has been thoroughly shattered. The US just surpassed a million confirmed coronavirus cases, by far the most of any country. And even adjusting for population, the US still stands among the hardest hit. The reasons for this are many, delayed lockdowns, lack of essential protective equipment for hospitals, and perhaps most critically, a dire lack of testing, especially in the early stages of the outbreak. In the month after the US had its first confirmed case, the US only tested around 3,000 people. By comparison, in the month after their first case, South Korea tested 100,000. And with much more data about who had the virus, they were able to implement rigorous contact tracing to identify the travel of each confirmed case. And looking at the infection curves of both countries, it is not a coincidence that South Korea's curve flattens relatively quickly, and America's does not. The US has ramped up testing since then, but it is still severely lagging behind what is needed. To reopen the US by mid-May, the number of daily tests performed between now and then should be as much as 700,000, and right now it is nowhere near that. You cannot fight a fire blindfolded. Yes. It, it is a failing, I mean, let's admit it. The main test in question, at the center of all this chaos, is called an RT-PCR test, and something about it has crippled the response of the most developed country in the world. What is it about this test that has been so problematic? And can scientists and biotech companies rush to make something better? The current standard for coronavirus testing is the Reverse Transcription Polymerase Chain Reaction, or RT-PCR test. To test someone, you first have to swab deep into their throat and nose to collect cells that potentially have the virus. The sample is then added to a lysis buffer, which breaks open the cells so that the viral RNA can be extracted, if it is present. The viral RNA is then amplified by transcribing the RNA to DNA using an enzyme called reverse transcriptase, and then allowing the DNA to replicate many times. Then, short fragments of DNA that are complementary to certain sections of the viral DNA are added, called primers. These primers will attach themselves to target sections of the viral DNA if it is present in the sample. Also added to the mix are small sections of DNA called reporters, which contain a fluorescent marker, which will bind to the DNA near the primer. A polymerase enzyme then latches on where a primer has bound to a strand of DNA. The enzyme moves along the strand, adding complementary nucleotides until the strand is copied. When the polymerase reaches the reporter sequence, a fluorescent probe is released, creating an optical signal that the strand has been copied. As more coronavirus genes get amplified over time, the fluorescent lights glow brighter and brighter. You can't physically see the fluorescence, so the RT-PCR machine records spikes on a graph that tracks the glowing as it gets brighter, revealing whether the sample contained the coronavirus. Negative results won't show the spikes. PCR tests have been around for decades. They are the gold standard for testing viruses because the process is highly sensitive. It can detect even a tiny amount of virus in a sample. But PCR tests are not something that every hometown hospital can do. Any lab doing coronavirus PCR tests needs federal approval to run the test and must prove that they meet the quality standards required. They must have qualified technicians and the lab has to be very, very clean because any amount of contamination can ruin the test. And with bureaucratic obstacles in the way of many labs trying to get federal approval, there just isn't enough of these labs to keep up with current demand. Each test usually takes about four hours, once a sample reaches an approved testing lab. But with transportation time and the backlogs that have formed, getting a result can take more than a week. And on top of an already complicated process was a catastrophic blunder made by the CDC. On February 5th, 
the CDC began to send out the coronavirus test kits it had developed, the only test permitted in the U.S. at that time. But soon after, many of the kits were found to have faulty negative controls. Samples known to be negative were showing a positive result, meaning the tests themselves were contaminated with the coronavirus. All of the tests had to be recalled and remade. It took the CDC about a month to fix the problem, a huge delay at a time where there was no room to have one. It's clear that the US could have been more prepared, but even if they had been, the standard method of PCR testing is just slow. People want to find out if they have the virus now, not in days or weeks from now. And the only way to achieve this is not through swabbing and shipping samples to a few specialized labs across the country, but through point of care testing. Sampling, testing, and getting results on the spot, within hours or even minutes. Point of care testing is already commonplace for other viruses. Doctors regularly run influenza tests in their offices and can have results back in around 15 minutes. These types of tests don't detect the viral genes in a patient sample. Instead, they look for proteins, or antigens, on the surface of the virus. And recently, protein-based coronavirus tests have been developed and in theory could greatly speed up testing wait times. If the target coronavirus antigen is present in a patient's sample, it will bind to specific antibodies fixed to a paper strip and generate a visually detectable signal, usually within 30 minutes. These tests are quick and cheap and easy to do. However, while fast, they have some drastic limitations and drawbacks. Unlike PCR, which amplifies and detects any amount of viral genetic material in a sample, protein tests completely rely on how much viral material is in a single sample. And you need a lot of virus in a sample to see a positive signal. The WHO reports that the sensitivity of these tests is likely only between 34 and 80% meaning that half or more of people who are infected by COVID-19 who are tested by this method might be told they are not infected. Another point of care testing method is the antibody or serology test. After a small prick to the finger, the test detects the presence of antibodies in the blood using antigens from the virus and thus can indicate who has already had the disease and recovered from it. Some tests can even be done at home and results can be given in minutes but the test doesn't detect the virus itself, only the immune response against it. Thus, the tests are useless for intervention in an infection. But knowing who has already had the virus and who is likely immune would still be useful information. It could tell us just how prevalent and fatal the disease really is and allow some recovered people to go back to work. But unfortunately, many of the antibody test kits circulating the world are being revealed to be extremely questionable. The UK ordered 3.5 million at-home antibody tests, only to find the tests were extremely inaccurate. Spain, too, had to scrap their antibody testing plan after tests they ordered were found to be only 30% accurate. And inaccurate tests like this are not just ineffective, but dangerous. The worst possibility is if you say, okay, you're protected, people go back to work thinking that they're protected and they wind up getting infected. The WHO does not recommend using point-of-care protein or antibody-based testing for patient care. Only gene-based tests are sufficiently accurate and reliable. A gene-based test that can give results quickly and in any hospital or doctor's office would be the best way to manage this pandemic. Gene-based or molecular point-of-care diagnostics do exist, but the field is very young, and the coronavirus outbreak is putting many biotech companies to the ultimate test. They are rapidly adapting technology to work for COVID-19 in the hopes that their tests could be what solves the testing shortage. These tests use the same basic methodology as the lab-based test, but automate a number of the steps involved to make them much quicker and much more streamlined than lab-based tests. Cepheid is one company that sells small PCR systems for rapidly detecting influenza viruses, tuberculosis bacteria, and other microbes. They knew that their system could, in theory, also test for the coronavirus with a few adaptations to the technology. But they too had to get FDA approval to be able to do so. By the end of March, the approval finally came in and their tests began to be rolled out across the country. The test starts with a nasal sample taken with a swab, which is then dropped into a liquid-filled tube. The liquid containing the sample is then pipetted into a disposable test cartridge and the cartridge is inserted into the test machine. After this, the process is automatic. The sample is then drawn through a filter which traps any pathogens. 
Then, a sonic horn breaks apart the pathogens and releases their genetic material. The genetic material is then amplified with reverse transcriptase, and a positive test will show fluorescent spikes in the same way as the PCR method outlined previously, and it can produce results in 45 minutes. The difference between this test and the traditional PCR test is its small size and its largely automated process. The test can be carried out in any hospital close to the patient, and the rapid result can inform healthcare workers what level of care and isolation the patient requires right away. The automated process means that minimal human action is needed to carry out the test beyond adding the sample to it. This makes the whole process faster and reduces the possibility of contamination, which means the test doesn't require a specially trained technician. Right now, there are about 5,000 of these test systems in the US with more on the way. Another of these systems is called ID Now. It's the size of a toaster and can produce results in less than 15 minutes, making it the fastest test there is. It saves time by amplifying nucleic acids at one temperature, rather than the lengthier process of thermocycling used in conventional systems. There are around 18,000 of these units across the US. Rapid, point-of-care tests like this are set to become a crucial element of the widespread testing that can inform countries on when to emerge from their lockdowns. In a perfect future, tests like this should exist at airports, train stations, and cruise terminals, where there is a high risk of virus transmission, allowing for a quick response should an outbreak arise. But, like everything involving this pandemic, optimism here needs to be somewhat reserved. A new study reports that some of these devices may not produce the most accurate results. They found that ID Now only detected the virus in 85.2% of positive samples, meaning it had a false negative rate of 14.8%. So 15 out of 100 people would be told that they're negative for COVID-19 when they're actually positive. And that is not good. A good test should be at least 95% accurate. The Cepheid test kit fared much better, with a false negative rate of only 1.8%. But the study overall calls into question the accuracy of these tests, which are being rolled out so quickly. And this brings up an extremely challenging debate about developing and approving tests. Moving too slowly, leaving up too much red tape, and an abundance of overcaution has already caused delays that undoubtedly cost lives. But botched or inaccurate tests can also be equally, if not more, devastating. Some scientists and regulators argue that no test is better than a bad test for the delays and harm they can cause. But others argue that perfect is the enemy of good, and that any and every amount of testing now is better than nothing, even if some percentage of the results are flawed. It is a constant debate, a push and pull of accuracy versus speed. And when the clock is ticking and lives are at stake, doing the right thing at every turn is essential, but also impossible. Finding ways we can combat the coronavirus as a society is at the forefront of everyone's minds. We anxiously look towards testing, vaccines, and viral treatments, hoping to hear good news that will ease our lockdown situation, but also marveling at the progress being made so quickly. I am personally fascinated by the breakthroughs being made all the time in the face of this pandemic, like the mRNA vaccines I mentioned in the last video, or the rapid PCR machines that will help bulk up the testing response. A crisis like this shows us that necessity is indeed the mother of invention, and I love the ingenuity that is cropping up in the scientific community. If you also like learning about these stories of scientific innovation in the face of this crisis, or just want to hear some positive news among so much bad news, you should check out the coronavirus documentaries on CuriosityStream. CuriosityStream is a streaming platform that has thousands of high-quality, high-budget documentaries, like this one, called Coronavirus Treating the Disease, where you can hear from the medical experts searching for techniques to treat the illness. And if you're a fan of educational content and looking for more quality things to watch during your quarantine, then this is the perfect time to sign up because a subscription to CuriosityStream now also comes with a subscription to Nebula. Nebula is a place where the top educational content creators like Polyphonic, Wendover Productions, and our other channel, Real Engineering, can create videos freely without worrying about the YouTube algorithm or demonetization. It's a place where we can upload our content ad-free and also experiment with original content and new series. The original content is my favorite part of Nebula. Shows like the logistics of D-Day, working titles, or Tom Scott's game show Money, where he pits a bunch of YouTubers against each other in psychological experiments where they can work together or profit individually. 
So if you sign up for CuriosityStream with the link in the description, you'll get one month of CuriosityStream free and get a free Nebula subscription. And for a limited time, CuriosityStream is offering their documentary distancing discount, which gives you 40% off all their annual plans and gift cards. So go to curiositystream.com slash real science to sign up. It's a great way to support this channel and all your favorite educational content creators. Thanks for watching, and if you would like to see more from me, the links to my Instagram, Twitter, and Patreon are below.